Nice to have you with us, folks, because we have one of the most interesting people I have truly ever met in my life. We go back as far as high school, somebody I've been a fan of forever. I'm very fortunate the show has brought us together back in touch, and now I can show off how interesting my great old friend is in this world. But with that, I'd like to welcome my guest here on the Productive Conversations podcast. This is Rob Duncan. Rob, what's going on, buddy? Oh, man, you really hyped me up there. <laughs> hey, man, you deserve the hype. And as we go back as our freshman year of math, and I'm <laughs> um, in the band together, and um, seriously, Rob, you're one of my favorite people I ever went to high school with. I genuinely, genuinely mean that. Thank and, you. Um, some of the Norwalk folks, uh, as you know, now you told me right before you're actually now in the Midwest. You have left Connecticut and now are in the great state of Michigan. That's correct. That is correct. All right. All right. And um, for some of the still us East Coast folks, I have hello messages from Connor Mulford and Ryan Page. They say hello. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, man, why don't we go into that? Rob, how did you go from the East Coast of Connecticut in the tri-state area to Michigan the great with the Great Lakes and stuff like that? Yeah, so I had just uh, graduated college, and I was back home with uh, my parents and trying to figure life out as it yeah. goes. And I was – this is going to be your, your classic uh, – boring millennial love story but I was looking for a romantic relationship with someone mm -hmm. who shared you know the same faith as me I'm a Christian mm -hmm. and so I I don't even remember the name of the app <laughs> but it was some Christian dating app and I set the distance like max to like 75 miles or something and next 75. thing I know I'm, talk I'm talking to this girl and she lives in Wisconsin I'm like, okay, something didn't go right here, but we <laughs> really hit it off. And next thing I know, I'm visiting and Christmas, and then I decided to to make the move. How about that? Wow, that is that is quite a millennial story. Congratulations! <laughs> and um, you guys recently got married, right? Yeah, back in um, September 2019. All right, congratulations with that. Like a little year and change. I'm sure it's been a Quite an interesting time to be newlyweds, the very, yeah, <laughs> six, well, what, I guess, September, March, six months in, and then the world completely turns upside down. How, how about that, huh? And yeah, we, um, we beat the virus by, by a half a year. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is great with your conversation that you're telling us that these dating apps really do work if we find the right person. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, like I've talked before, when come when any time I've talked to him about dating and relationships, I feel whatever's meant to be will happen. And you clearly proved the point right here. <laughs> so, thanks for showing that. How's um you know, on a, on that point? I feel like our our culture in general tends to really like romanticize and worship those kinds of relationships. Yeah, and tell me yeah, elaborate on that. Obviously, you know, it's kind of wired in us to to desire, you know, that person to, mm -hmm. you know, fall in love with, live life with, dream with. And those are all good things. But I think what often gets overlooked is in searching for those relationships, we forget about ourselves. For that, amen to that. I mean, I, I love being married. I love my wife. But it can be a really tough mirror sometimes. Really? I'm sure there's a lot of... Uh... You know, without not without getting too personal, what what are you some of the things you have recently learned now as a married man, compared uh, to a uh, non-married man, to a young boy, to a married man? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think the biggest thing is, you know, your weaknesses affect that person so much. Really. Um, I mean, a big one that I've been working on and struggling with is just communication. Um, mm -hmm. Not being good at communication, not receiving things as well, not almost uh, being like uh, fearful of those conversations that force me to adjust. Yeah. All right. Well, and you know, with that, um, 
all those adjustments have, do you feel that, you know, sometimes time will be the thing that will help um, strengthen your bond? And I mean, you clearly love each other, as you said, and I'm sure, you know, it's a crazy time, especially you, as soon as you get married, the world goes in a, a way, a way, but I'm sure that all this stuff is only making you stronger as a human being and your relationship with your wife, I assume. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's always, it's good to put people in your life who encourage self-awareness and growth. And I think I've definitely found that in my wife and many friendships besides the romantic one, but. Mm -hmm. Would you say that though, as somebody who did find your, you know, you found your, you found your soulmate online and able to grow your relationship. Would you say that for all those people, as you said before, maybe you are looking things a little too deeply, maybe taking the apps a little too seriously. Do you feel from this experience, you could say, Hey, just do your thing, live your life. And then the things will all just fall naturally together. To an extent. I mean, I think you, you have to go after what you want. Yeah, you have, to, you have to know what you want. And that's where that self-awareness really comes into play. You have to be able to set goals, which is actually, <laughs> it's been a, a New Year's resolution of mine since last year to, and I have yet to succeed at it, but just figuring out a way to set goals for myself. Um, I lost the question. <laughs> mm-hmm. I went on a little bit of a side tangent there. What was the question again? No, I was just, basically, I was just say for anybody who may, at this point in their lives, maybe are very impatient. Maybe they would take the apps to heart a little too seriously. As someone who clearly has a very successful love story from Thumb Online, do you think that, um, like you would say to people, just don't worry, it'll come together? Things, I mean, as you said, like, of course, you have to put effort at the time. I mean, you can't just, just sit there and then, oh, everyone's coming with me. <laughs> but, like, as long as you I are, mean, I guess. I guess in short, yeah, because, I mean, when I started looking online, I had never thought anything was going to come of it. My attitude was literally, if I get matches, at least I'll know people, you know, think I'm good on the surface. <laughs> and it just would be like a little, you know, confidence booster. Um, right. So my attitude was even if, like, nothing was going to come of this, and next thing I know, it did, so... Look at that, man. That's so inspiring and beautiful to hear. And thank you for sharing that with us. And um, now when I look at these apps myself, when at times I'm on and off those apps and whatever, I will remember, hey, if it works for Rob, <laughs> it could work for me. You're so, a good looking guy, dude. You don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. You do too. It's like I compete with your amazing face you here, but thank you for that. Um, one thing we were saying before, so you are in Michigan in the Midwest. You, um, you grew up in Connecticut, right? Yeah. Tri-state area, New York Metro Connecticut. So can you tell me some of the big differences between the tri-state area, Connecticut to now Northern Michigan? Yeah. I mean, so many differences. I wouldn't say, you know, culture shock level. Um, Mm -hmm. but Oh, do you know off the top of your head what the population of Norwalk is? I think we're around 80,000. 80,000? I think the, between 60 to 80,000, maybe even 100,000. The city I live in now has a population of 8,000. Oh, shit. There's colleges bigger than that. <laughs> so I think the biggest difference was just moving from that fast pace, you know, everybody's a stranger kind of thing since there's so many people to this small town where. I can't go to Walmart without running into somebody I know. I mean, sometimes, like, when COVID hit and I could wear a face mask in Walmart, I was like, heck yeah, people can't recognize me now. (laughs) But I always joke around, like, I would, like, hide in the aisles if I saw somebody I knew because I just wanted, you know, you go to Walmart, you get in, get out. That's not really the mentality around here. And I've definitely grown – it's grown on me. I I like the definitely more friendly environment. Mm -hmm. Um, I think – yeah, there's just a more hospitality-based culture, I think, here. Mm. Where in, in, you know, the tri-state area, everything's fast-paced. Um, right. You got pl- 
people to see, places to go. Mm-hmm. And you're, you know, you're just going. Look at that. Now you, you could, you don't need to go as fast as you need to. You could take the moments in and um, as you grow yourself pretty professionally, that's uh, seems the gist I'm getting. And that's really cool. How's the food out in Michigan? Is the food good? Is it different I, than here? I don't know if Mexi- Michigan is known <laughs> for a specific cuisine. Obviously, like New York's got known for its pizza, and like Los Angeles is known for its Mexican food, Texas barbecue, yeah. stuff like that. Is Michigan associated with anything like that, or is it just? Um, I guess like one thing that's here that's pretty big is this these uh things called pasties. Um, pasties. They're they're kind of they're like little pies almost in almost the shape of my wife hates me when I compare them hates it when I compare it to like a calzone but it's kind of like Ooh. a calzone but more of like a pie crust and smaller and it's got potatoes oh, um goodness steak chicken it can have um peppers just various vegetables and that's probably like something that's that I'd never seen before moving here Wow, I uh, just Googled it first when they thought I said pasties. We got a quite a different Google image. Yeah, don't, don't but Google the, that. <laughs> but uh, that when I put Michigan to it, um, wow, these do look excellent, like a beautiful empanadas. I might uh, yeah, one day with the travel, and I hope we can get some soon. <laughs> this looks excellent. Uh, there's a lot of Italians in the area, so there's actually mm-hmm. really good pizza. Um, All so, right. So that makes compared to the pizza at home. Or is it like a special style with it? Oh man, I I haven't had pizza in so long, like back east, that I can't even remember like where I used to go. Um, <laughs> I guess Colony I used to go to a lot in Stanford. Yeah, yeah. Did you know they have a Colony in Norwalk now? That just opened up like a couple years ago, right? Yeah, yeah. It is relatively new. Okay. And also in Norwalk, we got we put a mall there. I don't know if you know. There's now a mall right in the um. In almost right when you get off the exit going to South Norwalk. Exactly, big mall right there. It was it was a dirt pile for my entire life. Yep, yep. <laughs> it was there was a shortcut to the dump, but now um, they really talk about gentrification. They really, I kind of I like the mall. I think it's a nice little spot and uh. That's right. Right before I left, they had all the like the steel framing up. Yeah, it's uh, it, it it is pretty cool. We got an Apple and I store think they, now. They finished the parking garage too, right before I left. That he that's some parking garage, and there's like there's some good food places like Pinstripes is well known. There's this new, it's called Yard House. This like, this chain going around the country. You could get yard yard beers like, as big as a yard stick. It's um a fascinating time for for all of us right here in the East Coast as we terribly missed you, Rob. Yeah, I was I was supposed to be coming back for Thanksgiving, but then mm. I mean COVID just Yeah, I think I think it might have been Ryan who said it on this pat on this podcast on that uh first episode he was on. Mm. But he said something along the lines of and maybe I've hear, heard this somewhere else, but he said that COVID has really shook um what did he say? He's really shook kind of like the foundations we live life on, like time, Easily. family work yeah how have you um been managing things going on over these past nine months since covid hit uh it was interesting at first uh i work as a i'm training to become an electrician so technically Mm -hmm. i'm considered like an essential worker um so at first we kept working and then um, my boss's wife uh she she's diabetic so he was just trying to be extra careful so i want to say two three weeks into the whole thing we took about a month five weeks off Mm -hmm. um and then we went back to work and then recently i got like this like overnight or like 24 hour bug or something Mm -hmm. um but because of that i had to go get tested and it by the time i got the results back i missed another week of work and then he just got sick um, he's pretty sure he had it, even though he tested negative. Did you um, test negative as well? I also tested negative. Good, um, good. But he tested negative, and he had pretty much all the symptoms, except he never lost, like, taste and smell. Yeah, um, that, it's been quite a scary just time. the way it knocked him out, 
but yeah, I missed another week because of that. So it's just like work has been super undependable that, which mm. obviously makes life a lot more stressful than it needs to be. Um, right. But yeah, we've been hanging in there. Um, definitely miss, uh, you know, gathering in big groups of friends. Definitely. Um, we have done it a few times, but just not as often as we would have. Yeah, man. I, I hear you there. It's just it's all these days unpredictable. As we are recording this, though, the United Kingdom did give its first doses to the citizens, um, their citizens. Uh, obviously, they gave it to the elderly and more high risk. And, uh, yeah, I just hope, man, you know, we can have our conspiracies. We can have our debates about this. But at yeah. the end of the day, we just want this to be over. Mm-hmm. We just want it to be over. We can debate conspiracy theories, go crazy, be the, be like the whole, the the Alex Jones is in the world. We can yeah. say that for this, this is over. We just got to finish this and not be nervous to go out, go out to get gas and go to the grocery store. Cause we don't know what's going on, you know, I'm sure yeah. you the same way. Yeah. And it's like people pretty much our age, we're like, you know, we're just, we're just starting out, you know, and that yeah. in and of itself is hard enough without all the, yeah, craziness of this virus. So for sure. And um, as many other people are trying to find their silver linings, I mean, we're doing this as a result of something the pandemic um, caused this podcast, though. And I'm not going to say it was worth the COVID pandemic to have this happen because there's just been too much tragedy with it. But at least with everything going on that we get, get something out of this time, I was able to do something like this, get in touch with you, chop it up. Yeah. and uh, Heck, it was because you know, of because of covid that i started listening to podcasts at all i mean it really I, before covid if i would have seen that I'm, i might have checked out an episode but i probably wouldn't have really gotten hooked like i did just because i wasn't really podcasting before covid How, what are some of the shows that you have uh, been discovery with uh um in this time uh there's a there's an electrician's podcast called modern electrician all um, right shout to modern electrician um there's a backpacking podcast that I like to listen to called Back Backpacking and Blisters. Mm. Um, and then there's a uh, one called The Bible Project, and they kind of talk a lot about different various like theological topics and dig mm-hmm. into the history. And those are just a few of them. <laughs> How about that, so backpacking. You, I know, and you are pre-COVID, and I'm sure post-COVID you all were a world traveler, right? You actually have backpacked at various places around the world, right? Uh, not, I wouldn't really say around the world. But at least in uh, the United States, though? Yeah. Where, can you tell, tell me about that? Where have you uh, backpacked uh, and stuff? Where, have you, where are these great journeys and adventures you've <laughs> taken, Rob? There, there is a lot on my list of places I, I would love to go. Um, but so far, I've gotten to do a lot of the White Mountains in New Hampshire and Maine. The White Mountains. Um, the Adirondacks, which are in upstate New York. Oh, yeah. Um, Very familiar. They have 46 high peaks, which are all peaks that are higher than 4,000 feet elevation. Oh, my. And I did in two two-week trips. I did all 46 of them in two different That's summers. Incredible. Wow. Um, what did it feel like, Rob? whether it was the White Mountains or the Adirondacks and the other places you get, what did it feel when after all that grinding and hard work and, and that physical toll, when you finally got on that mountain and you saw those incredible <laughs> views that only people on Instagram wish they were actually there to see? What was it like when you were literally on top of those mountains, Rob? I mean, it's, it's refreshing. You, you know, you get up there and you see everything you worked for. And that, wow. that's definitely why the whole mountaintop analogy is so, you know, cliche and overused. But you really, you, you work and you grind and you sweat and you get to the top and you're like, just take that first breath of air. and No phone and no service too. That must have been beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The disconnecting is one of my favorite aspects of it. Um, the most... Uh, most exotic place I ever hiked was uh, actually in. Um, I'm sorry, do you mind repeating that? We got cut off for a second. The, mo- the oh. highest peak was what? 
the the most exotic place I've hiked was in Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, and what yeah. was that like going over there, New Guinea, and uh, that's right by you know that's an Asian country and stuff. What was that? Yeah, like? I mean, I I joked earlier about like moving to Michigan not quite being culture shock. Uh, mm-hmm. Over there was definitely um, just a culture shock. Uh, I mean, it's the where I was was pretty you know, third world country. Um, I was actually there with an organization called Ethnos 360. And they specialize in doing like humanitarian work. And they're they're a Christian organization. So their main thing is they want to tell people about Jesus. Um, Mm -hmm. But they do a lot of like, they teach English as a second language. They teach math. They teach English. They get to kind of remote tribal peoples. And they try to provide you know education health care stuff like that <laughs> and right. i spent uh two weeks in one of those tribal locations and i mean it was you know batch huts chickens everywhere mm. um, just very like farming culture agricultural um and one of the the cultural shocks that i experienced was um over there you know, women do all the physical labor in, really? in the tribe I was in. Women do the physical labor and men do like the hard work, which is like thinking and planning. And so it's pretty normal to see like a woman <laughs> like walking with like a sack that must weigh 60 plus pounds um, oh, hey. while breastfeeding an infant with it's two toddlers time. hanging off of her legs. Oh man, that's why we love our women in this world and how and <laughs> exactly. how much they contribute and can be heroes and help us out and put their team on the back. Shouts to all the women who do do that and put the team on their back when we need them, you know? Yeah. Like when you were there and you were amongst those tribes and, and the indigenous people, did a lot of emotions come out? Where did you like rethink things about, you know, what it's like being in the first world country and, and being here. I mean, you mentioned the culture stock, but what were some of the emotions that really that came out of you when you were there? Yeah, I think it's, it's at the end of the day, people are people. And yeah. there are so many people in this world that you don't even know exist. You know, they're not even on the radar. And yes, they, that's true we can be very wrapped up in our own perspectives. You know, we're, we're the center of our universe a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's so important to just step out of that and, and realize how, how different some people have it. And I think it's just a couple of things that are important is you can perceive somebody as being worse off than you, but mm-hmm. really like they're happier and they live a more fulfilled life. That's what I that's what I really have learned too, that really possessions are what you make of it. It's about your attitude, loving yourself, genuinely caring about the other people around you. And I think though I know it's easier said than done, but I feel that I need at some point in my life I need to go to another a third world country like that. Really um humble myself and or whether third world country or just a impoverished a poverty stricken places in the United States that need some help at anywhere in this whole country. I think, um, I think I need to do that. And not to sound preachy or pretentious. <laughs> when I, say yeah. that. I really don't want to give that vibe off, but I think, um, especially starting this podcast and talk with so many different people. And, you know, I've talked to so many people from other countries and I really think, you know, without sounding pretentious, I really feel that, I need to humble myself with stuff like this. And obviously yeah, and, in the non cobra world, I think that's something to really consider. And I mean, you know, shouting back out to the, the episode with Bladar. Yes, the I great mean, Bladar. His advice he gave was travel, see the world, see yeah. everything you can. And it sounds so simple, but at the end of the day, you only know what you know. Really, it is very much so. Like, you know me, I love my stories. I love my movies and um, I love my TV and as a writer, which I really identify myself as, I really need to see other parts of the world. So one, I can just write stories about it. Yeah. It really helps mold myself into a person. 
And I just, again, without sounding pretentious or just saying it because of the right thing to do, I, I genuinely believe that. And I will put my money where my mouth is at some point in the near future and people can hold me accountable, but I really want to experience a few days in the place of, um, in a place where I can be humbled, you know, whether that's a third world yeah. country, whether that is a, another place in the United States, I really, I really want to experience something like that and say I did it too. Yeah. I think at, at the end of the day, it's, you know, the, the motivation is to love people better. Yeah. And I think, you know, I grew up, I got to go on like many, you know, short trips and like growing up, I went to Belize a few times and Ooh. did work at a church there where we helped build a church. And um, yeah, these were short tri- trips, like one week long each. But at the end of the day, the, the thought behind it, the motivation was to, to be helpful to someone else and to see something that would, you know, greatly impact your life. And that's what you really got out of that, huh? You really... It, it really must have put a wholesome and profound effect on you. Yeah. Are you, are you a fan of like Lord of the Rings by any chance? You know, um, I, I have been, I, I, I recently got into the movie. I never watched the movies. Um, I only watched the first one, but as you know, when COVID hit, my plan was to hit all of the culture significant movies that I haven't seen yet, which includes the Lord yeah. of the Rings trilogy <laughs> and then the Hobbit. So, um, on my list of do the days, if you ever see my Instagram, it's whatever movie I'm watching. And I've seen the first Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring. I thought it was quite an epic masterpiece. I'm yeah. really thrilled for the Twin Towers and um, and the, the two Return towers. of the, the, Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Your New Yorkers coming out. <laughs> rest, rest in peace to the Twin Towers, for real. And the, the Two Towers, and then the Return of the King. And yeah. I was very profound by it you know i really liked it a lot i love the character development i love the production design of of the very first one great peter jackson insane battles and fantasy sequences i i think it's incredible yeah so so tell me Uh, what do you think of the lord of the rings trilogy man i i had brought it up because i'm a i grew up actually reading the books and i saw i saw the movies also because like my dad read the books and he was super excited when those films were coming out um and you know i brought it up because i'm a i'm a big tolkien fan now i've read a lot of his yeah. like, short stories and essays and he has this uh i guess like philosophy of what he calls the primary and secondary worlds which yeah. is why he writes these epic adventure tales um so in his mind you know your your primary world is you know, where you live, your, your apartment, your, your job, you know, your education, whatever. And the secondary world is anything you go to, to, in a sense, escape that primary world, Mm -hmm. but to come back to, you know, the, the goal is to come back to it. So it could be a good show you're watching. It could be your writing. It could be music. But if those things don't actually benefit your primary world, you know, what's the point in that journey? Oh, dude, that really affirms being a cinephile and, and loving pop <laughs> culture and stuff like that. Because, yes, we can get, thing, we can get something out of these, th- these works of art, these hobbies, these activities. We all can have it for the benefit as long as we choose it. I mean, even video games, especially video games now are – really have come a long way especially some of the storytelling and some of the uh amazing graphics yes you could be one person who plays video games all day get stoned get uh just go 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 and uh well you could just play a video game but sometimes (laughs) you can also look at it as like a way to problem solve use your hand eye coordination if you're some of these there's some amazing writing in some of these games you could just another way to experience a story i think that's something that i get out of that and I very much identify with that primary world and uh, the um, secondary world. Sometimes we do have to put ourselves out of the box to make us better, you know? Yeah. Our ultimate escapes. I think, I think the key is not to, I guess, you know, make a feast out of that secondary world. You know, you mm-hmm. don't want to 
you know, overindulge to the point where you're actually not doing anything in your actual life. Yeah. Like you said, you could play video games all day and I sure love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely sit in front of my computer for hours at a time. Oh, so many Saturdays I wish I could take back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> what are some of those games you've um, been playing? You playing any uh, new recently? Did you get a new Xbox, the new Xbox One Series X or did you get a PS5? I, I have not. I have a, a hand-me-down Xbox One and a couple games I can run on my computer. So PCs are like your thing? Oh, definitely not. My PC is just a standard laptop. It can't run any oh, okay. games, unfortunately. It can't run any good games. I can run a few games on it. What are some um, of the games you've been playing, whether console or the PC? Or laptop, yeah, so I should say. I don't have a PlayStation 3 anymore, but I kept going back to a game called The Last of Us. Oh! That changed the game, The Last of Us. Um... That game, I personally haven't played it, but uh, okay, tell me about it. Tell me about the great Last of Us. I, I won't I won't give any spoilers just because, well, it would hurt me to spoil that game for somebody. Um, <laughs> but it, it places your character in a post-apocalyptic world where there's zombies. You know, kind of your, your typical, mm -hmm. uh, people are obsessed with that genre right now. Um, but what it does differently, especially as a video game, is it, it tells a story. Better yeah. than, better than most video games, in my opinion, have ever done. Um, the characters, the voice acting is incredible. Um, a funny story about this game is I was actually playing it in a public space when I was in school. Okay. And I'm just playing this game, right? And next thing I know, I have a crowd of like 15 people watching 15. me play this game like it's a movie. Yeah, I've heard it's like pretty common for people to watch the cutscenes on YouTube and just watch it for fun. <laughs> I think uh, our, our mutual friend Ryan Page has done that. Um, and, I'm also guilty of that. <laughs> but I heard it's just incredible. I think people go as far as the best game in the last 25 years, game of the decade, some sure. the best game in the the original of this past gaming consoles, and um, I mean it it. The plot is good. Um, the gameplay is a little, little grindy. It's, okay. Because the game, it, it forces you to be slow. It forces you to be methodical because it's just, it's difficult. You have to use every bit of the, the world to your advantage. Um, but there's insane character development. Um, there's, you know, just moral questions that you would never think to ask. And I actually, it's actually really relevant in today's context because i mean it's about a virus that takes over like humanity and turns them into wow. these like feral monsters granted covid hopefully isn't doing that please don't i know it's still 2020 <laughs> right yes yes <laughs> but i mean the question it poses is would you sacrifice mankind for someone you love that's pretty that's pretty uh that's pretty deep man that's very uh walking dead man it's huh? yeah it's like I suppose that, that question has probably been posed numerous times in various genres and mediums, but just the fact that a video game is able to effectively pose that question. Yeah. And I, mean, who, I mean, coming from movie. Crash Bandicoot, <laughs> freaking playing Mario and Tetris to a game making me ask that question to myself. <laughs> Of course, and we definitely all love those games for different reasons. But that one really, um, I mean, that's that that got emotion out of us. That's the best part of any story. As long as the story can get you emotions, and people say whether it's here, whether it's yeah. here, and well, whether it's it's a, from the Mank movie, but emotions, no matter where we get them from, um, that's what makes something honestly between good and bad and would you and you would say from all those reasons the plot the more the morals the uh the message it gives that's why the last of us has such a profound effect on everyone in pop cult and has a special place in pop culture yeah i've i've heard rumors of the of amazon making a show oh yeah that's what I was about to say hbo has been um green HBO. hbo in fact will be doing a a uh, mini series on The Last of Us, the great Adam McKay of um, known for Vice and uh, The Big Short. Also, he directed Anchorman and 
Tyler Dick at night, and he is going to be the head of – he's going to be one of the showrunners. And with that, too, that you have, you played The Last of Us 2, because I know that – I, I don't have the system, and I haven't, I haven't touched it. I haven't – I saw a couple people, like, everyone was pissed off about it. Yeah, I heard it was very <laughs> divisive and very polarizing. And so I, I haven't really touched it. Do you think you will eventually someday? Just to see where, where, where they go? Or are you going to let um, your, your opinion with The Last of Us not get changed with the sequel? I, mean, that's, I, I think that's I just the risk need... with all sequels. I need The Last of Us to be a pure memory for me. <laughs> I hear that, man. I cannot have that defiled. Man, I mean, one, I mean, as you said, once you had The Last of Us where you have 15 people watching it, they're assuming, what show is this? It's my video. And, you know, controller. being that, like, I'll watch, like, YouTube, like, random video game stuff and things I'm looking for on YouTube. And so I, I just remember everyone was freaking out and I was just avoiding these titles on, of these YouTube videos. And like yeah. one of them was like, I would describe the last of us two as a suffer fest with no end. <laughs> I was that like, that was the title, huh? <laughs> that was the title. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to stay away from the game. I, I don't, mm-hmm. number one, I, I can't justify buying a PlayStation four to play this game. <laughs> The sequels are something else, man. But uh, yeah. I am really looking forward to Cyberpunk 2077. Cyberpunk 2077. Um, that's a upcoming. I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. What is? Have you is, heard of CD Projekt Red? CD Projekt Red. Um, I'm afraid I haven't, but it they're, sounds incredible. They're and a small a, gaming developing company. Game developer. I don't know what, what the term would be for it. Um, mm-hmm. but they've up to this point, they've only made the Witcher series. Oh, okay, great. And then the Witcher series is, has been a huge hit for video games and it also obviously a very big Netflix show. Yeah. The, the show is, the show is interesting. Um, yeah, I've heard some th- good things about it and I, I see think, from, I'm sorry. Um, you were saying, yeah, I just like the, the games are just at the bar for like the fantasy world gaming, in my opinion. Um, and so just the, the depth of story that they tell, I, I don't know that the Witchers, the Netflix Witcher series has yet to do it justice, but mm-hmm. I know they're coming up with another season. So I, I mean, I will watch it. I love the Witcher still. So. Yeah. It, the, we have seen, it's been very difficult for video game adaptions to be good. We've seen some terrible ones, Assassin's Creed, Super Mario, <laughs> but maybe we're starting to come around the sonic the hedgehog movie wasn't that bad and um obviously the witcher has um made big strides but um about a Cy- Mario movie yeah it's pretty shit john Osmo <laughs> and uh bob hoskins and well that should have just been animated it's live action early i think it's early 90s and wow how have i not seen this at least just to make fun of it it is worth the if you want to have something to make fun of, I encourage it. But do, about do you ever watch films to just make fun of them? Like you know they're bad, like like Room. I do actually. I um, I think it's important if you're really into movies and TV to watch the bad stuff too because it helps your brain. If you take amazing things, your brain can only take so much. Sometimes you just need to watch a horrible movie just yeah. to laugh, not to take too much into it. Um. And uh, I do, I will take the time and effort to watch bad movies purposely <laughs> just, just to see what not to do and just enjoy their way to tell an interesting story. But tell me some of your favorite bad movies. You mentioned The Room with the great Tommy Wiseau. I mean, that's one of the most quotable movies ever. And I mean, that movie and, is just an enigma to me because it really just word. exists out of a culture of this movie is trash. Let's make fun of it together. Oh, yeah. That's a genuine activity you could do. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's drinking. You can look up drinking games online. It's like, <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, look at um, some of the absurd things in that movie. There, we, we see Tommy and his wife. Does anyone <laughs> notice he, he, they serve each other vodka mixed with, what's it? I think it's vodka mixed with, vodka mixed with scotch. Straight. I never noticed that. And I'm like, they're extremely dangerous. We obviously know the million plot holes that fall, that random drug dealer that is never mentioned again. <laughs> the uh, mom mentioning she has breast cancer. I mean, jeez. But and I, I think uh, 
my my favorite bad movie. Oh, I mean, I don't even know if it con- is considered a feature length film because I'm pretty sure it's only 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. But Kung Fury. Kung Fury. <laughs> Have you heard of this? I th- let me Google it. I think <laughs> I think I. Okay, no, this is, I thought it was something else, but shoot, with the great David Hasselhoff, I see. So the <laughs> the premise is that the main character is a police officer who like is amazing at kung fu, mm-hmm. and he's he's supposed to be like the chosen one called like Kung Fury, and somehow, <laughs> so there's there's a triceratop who's like part man, part triceratops. Interesting. There's Hacker Man who literally has like you know like a a key a keytar. Yeah, yeah. He has like a keytar but it's like a computer. <laughs> There's like time travel that happens and somehow like the main bad guy is Hitler who wants to be Kung Fury. <laughs> and so Kung Fury has to go back in time to defeat Hitler before he can become Kung Fury. Well, um, sometimes people put the passion and passion project. So, well, then that is a, uh, that is quite the film, but Hey, sometimes, you know, at the movie, at the end of the day is supposed to entertain you, whether it's good or bad. And Hey, if it entertains you, why not? Are there any other like really bad movies that you enjoy? I mean, of course there's a Sharknado. (laughs) Sharknado. I like a lot of Adam Sandler, bad movies, you know, like uh, I watch bad Adam Sandler movies just to point out things like. What would be your example Hill. of a bad Adam Sandler movie? I would say Jack and Jill. It's quite atrocious. I've never seen it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I would say so. These are bad Adam Sandler movies. You know, this is going to be a hot tape. I didn't really like Click. I don't think that's that good of a movie. I think it's a little too campy for me. I think it has a nice message about caring about family and stuff, but I think there's just some corny, not funny things in it. I think I'd uh, say I, I agree with that. <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> I think the Benchwarmers isn't a good movie, but I I will watch that all the time. And that's a Sandler somehow produced. I've never seen that. <laughs> oh man, it's it's fun. Sometimes there's just movies just to. For, to movie and enjoy but i do like a lot of other good sandler movies i think happy gilmore's good i think critics wouldn't yeah. like billy madison but i think it's good i uh, beg the wedding me. singer wedding singer is actually really good really good uh the longest Yard's not really that good of a movie but i really like uh, the longest yard the remake but i want to consider that a good movie okay and uh yeah those are some bad out of sandler movies <laughs> that I will enjoy, but have you don't get too seen um, into it? Shoot, I'm blanking on the name of it. You can remember it's a, it. It's a Paul Thomas Anderson film. Punch Drunk Love. Punch Drunk Love. I just think that's a great movie. I think I Adam Sandler. Adam Sandler's really good in that. I'd really, like to really see him in, in more like serious roles. Yeah, and he clearly he's capable of it. Uh, I, have you seen Uncut Gems? Never heard that one. Sorry, what? Have you seen Uncut Gems? I haven't seen that yet. Really? Well, I think it's on Netflix, and that's an I've, incredible role that I've he did. I've been hearing about it. I, I think I kind of will let it get cold, so it hasn't been, you know, how mm-hmm. Netflix will, like, showcase its things. Right. It's not right. being showcased anymore, but I have heard that I need to see it. It's incredible work. Um, and you mentioned Paul Thomas Anderson really quick. You like Paul Thomas Anderson films? The good old. PC oh, you're about to you're about to really get me going. <laughs> he tell, is tell me about I, the great Paul Thomas Anderson. He is my I, absolute favorite director. Why is that? Why is Paul Thomas Anderson your favorite director, Robert? In one word, character. Character. He knows how to throw you into anything any situation and make you care about a character and you bring that, that character somewhere. Whether good or bad. Whether good or bad. <laughs> I mean, Daniel Day-Lewis in um, There Will Be Blood. Mm. What do you think that movie is about, There Will Be Blood, Rob? Is it a nice movie on capitalism? I mean, I, 
on one hand, yeah, it's a movie about capitalism. It's about sacrificing family for money. Greed. But on the other hand, it's about searching for family. Yeah, searching for yourself. Um, what do you think that? Um, I, I think I think when I watch that and you see like turn of the century and the oil men and just his badass voice and stuff and he really is a scumbag. I mean, yeah. unredeeming. He's not. A, I wouldn't even consider him an anti-hero. He's just a fucking asshole. But yet, <laughs> I mean, he. We yeah, see his was... motives on why he's doing that and taking advantage of the of those times. You know. Yeah, and I, I think his character is he's really able to control the situations he's in with his words, with his voice. Right. And so that's where you see the breakdown between him and his son when his son loses his sense of hearing. Yep. Um, and that's where that – sorry, this is a major spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, yes, but spoiler alerts. In the R, that's where, alert. like, you really do see how – I mean, evil this man is. As yeah. soon as he loses his ability to, to control somebody, he yeah, doesn't yeah. know what to do with that person. His, his, the center of his relationships is control. What he can get people to do for him, what he can convince people to sell him. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and then he, the, he can't, he lost his ability for that control and he's useless and... Uh, as we see eventually his downfall. And as you said, the famous, I drink your milkshake about <laughs> another person. And um, like, as you mentioned that selfishness, that capitalism, that they will just take it. will take the, uh, will take the low person, maybe go as far as to kill them. And whether literally or figuratively. Yeah. Something else. Can I name you just a couple of other um, Paul Thomas Anderson movies? And you just tell me your initial thoughts on them. Sure. You seen Boogie Nights? Yes. Um, what, do you, what do you think of Boogie Nights? In one sentence, that film had me at the opening scene. It's just this epic. Um, what's the term for it? One shot. The shot is just long. The shot. shot is just moving. It, it's a long shot, and it's yep. continuous. And that shot, that shot almost didn't make it in the movie. That would that that would fuck the whole flow of it up. It shows the world we're about to join in for the next two and a half hours. I I think you know, overall that movie is it's kind of has the content that I, I tend to try to avoid that I don't mm -hmm. want to necessarily, you know, be um exposing myself to all the time. You know, there's a lot of nudity, drug use, yep. um, stuff like that. It's but a movie overall, on sex. I <laughs> I think it's another one which tends to be a big theme in a lot of PTA's films. It's, you know, that search for family. Yeah. I mean, Mark Wahlberg's character, John C. Riley, who's amazing in that film. Very, I mean, very both much of them so. are just prime examples of two characters looking for belonging. Um, we, see, we see the Julianne Moore character who is plays the mother figure to all these people in a, quite a taboo controversial industry yeah. and yet this among all this they could still have that family bond with it why do you think he chose to or like what do you think the significance of those characters being in the porn industry is because i mean it's pta that was done intentionally for sure he could have I, told that story in a deli mm -hmm. you I know th i think his again I used to I didn't know the literal answer and why he wrote it that way, but I just, it's just blaking it. But I think at the end of the day, he, and again, not to just um, repeat your point, but it is very much true that even in such a crazy taboo world, even in such a, as controversial as you can get. And in a time where things were peaking and being good in the late seventies, I think there were so many lost souls together almost like an island of misfit toys and there's one thing that will really castrate you that will put <laughs> you to the side as we saw julianne moore's character um in that course case literally lost her daughter because of the industry she is she had nowhere else to go except this very very weird thing known as adult of no worry known as a, excuse me she went to, out to this real world known as pornography and that was the only place to go so if you're in a place where 
you know, no one accepts you. Can you go and accept and be part of a world where people will, even if the outside world may not like or understand, and you will still get judged for it? Like we saw the Heather Graham with those frat bros. They wound up in the very hard scene to watch. They were abusing her simply because she wouldn't um, go to their demand sexually. She was just thrown into the side of the road. And who's the one person to pick her up? It's the porn director. So I think that's the message of it, that even in the most absurd things, you can still find a sense of community. So I think that's why PTA wrote this yeah, character. Too, in there. Yeah, I never thought of it that way. That's That's really good. Yeah, so... What a film that is. Crazy. <laughs> Lucky nights. How about Magnolia? How do you like Magnolia? <laughs> Another one of uh, John C. Riley's epic performances. How about Tom Cruise I, in that? Tom Cruise. I, I have a tendency to just crap on Tom Cruise whenever his name comes up, <laughs> but he kills it in Magnolia. Sure won the Oscar. He, he did the most un-Tom Cruise role ever. Was and he was he nominated for it that he year? He was nominated, but he didn't win for some Who won stupid that year? Would you know off the top of your head? Off the top of my head, certain years I do. Do you mind if I check really quick? Go for it. I'm curious. So that movie came out in 2006. <laughs> the movie came out in 1999. Oh, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, no worries. So he was nominated for best supporting actor. And his fellow nominees were Michael Clark Duncan, The Green Mile, Jude Law and The Talented Mr. Ripley, Haley Joel Osment in The Sixth Sense, and the winner is Sir the Great Michael Kang in The Cider House Rules, which is really good. And he is really good in it, but I just I mean Tom, hearing the names he was is nominated against. Hearing yeah. the names he was nominated against, he didn't really seem to have a chance. True, true. But I think for what, for at the end of the day, the best actor should go to who transform themselves in the best. And at the end of the day, it is all opinion based. It's not literal. You're not, I mean, you might win best actor by you, the literally, I mean, that's up to the opinion. So I think for what Tom Cruise, known as the mostly for action stars, mostly, you know, <laughs> yeah. the 80s, I think him showing legitimate acting chops, having insane monologues. And Heck, just the different. fact that he was nominated next to those names that must i wonder if that that must have been a huge compliment to him oh yeah absolutely we've seen the academy doesn't nominate just anyone but so yeah. i think he earned it and well i think uh we'll see maybe in some other day if he can earn it he's still actually it's crazy how i mean i know he's quote unquote old but he's been in hollywood forever yeah, you know he could still now go into those more mature roles, so we'll see. And I think this just shows that Tom Cruise has legitimate acting chops, and someone like oh, a Paul Thomas sure. Anderson gets it out of him, and he got it out of Adam Sandler. So, shouts to him for that. And Magnolia, <laughs> insane movie again on especially family on that one. I feel like that was also like Paul Thomas Anderson just being like, "I'm gonna make the movie I want to make." Oh. I'm not I'm not listening to any advice from anybody. Like, this is just going to be insane. For sure. And we appreciate directors who do as the boss to that. I mean, I will say it is a little bit too long. It's close to, it's pushing three hours. And actually, he also, just three hours. It's three hours and eight minutes. But um, even he went back and said that he wishes it was a little shorter. But yeah. I mean, what he tells like three different storylines in it. Right. It and, was just a, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? An ambitious undertaking. Ambitious sure. undertaking, for sure. I, I don't know if it's rewatchable. I do think there's some Tom Cruise I'd rewatch, but um, just to, <laughs> I think it's just great acting on Transform Yourself, but uh, all in all, great, great, great picture. And uh, we, t we hit upon Punch Drunk Love. How do you feel about, and we hit on There Will Be Blood. Have you seen The Master? Yes. <laughs> Now that's an act. That's an incredible piece of acting. Yeah, and shoot, there's so much you could say about the master. Joaquin Phoenix, something Joaquin else. Joaquin Phoenix. Um, I can't believe I'm making his name. Uh, oh my god. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Philip Seymour Hoffman, probably the best actor of the 2000s. The goat. 
seriously, we miss him dearly. And Amy Adams was incredible with that. And she was a very minor part in it, but she was nothing cap- but just like so captivating. Captivating, and, yeah. And again, I think that's one of his strengths. Paul Thomas Anderson is the acting he gets out of out of um the performances he gets out of his actors and tell me about that i mean about pretty much an allegory to uh to scientology and all the uh movie on manipulation and um how far and what you could change with people or you think it's something else and yeah. uh i'm afraid i haven't seen inherent vice yet but i thought phantom fred phantom fred was really good too you saw that i did um I would highly recommend Inherent Vice. That is my favorite PTA film. Really? I heard it's pretty funny. Is it funny? It's comical. It's comical, serious. I should say. It's heavy. It's dark. Um, yeah, it, it, he throws you into the world of this just kind of drugged up hippie private eye. Drugged up hippie private eye. That's a sad <laughs> And, you know, you're seeing the you know, this world through his perspective and it's not exactly a reliable perspective. So you're questioning everything. Mm-hmm. So the, the film is almost forcing you into the position of a detective. Oh, I mean, okay. you have to analyze everything and you have to say, did that really happen? I mean, at mm-hmm. one point in the film, Joaquin Phoenix's character is at a whiteboard tracking all the events. Mm-hmm. And... I actually think it's a genius shot because it's kind of what you have to do. I've, I've seen the film, I want to say eight or nine times. Okay. And every time I, I notice something more, I connect the dots better. Uh, really just funky cast. Josh Brolin. Um, I love Josh Brolin. The main character in Sicario, or not the main character, but the, the bad guy in Sicario. Is it, or maybe not uh... the bad guy, the assassin. Benicio um, del Toro. Benicio del Toro's in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see Owen Wilson. Else? Owen Wilson. That's I yeah. completely forgot he was in that. Um, just yeah, weird cast. They and they mesh together so well. Yeah, um, it seems a very. It seems it's a very art house film, which I I love. So, I gotta check this out. You're right. I th- very. I, I want to say like, I loved it because I just love the main character. You know, the first time I watched it, I just was observing Joaquin Phoenix's character, Doc. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was just, he was fascinating to me. Um, I think most people tend to say they don't like the film. Um, just because the plot is very, it's very hard to follow. Okay, you, Like I said, it makes you do the work of a detective. Well, I think that's awesome writing then. You know, some people just want it. I mean, every audience member is different. Maybe some people it's, just want to watch the movie with it. But, I definitely, uh, I'd say that it leans more toward being like along the lines of Magnolia than per se Boogie Nights as far as, you know, following it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what's great about it. He does have, all his screenplays are just so unique and uh, goes all over the place. So I'd, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely let you know how that goes. Cause you know me, I watch anything in this world. So uh, okay. I have to complete with the film. PTA filmography, so uh, um, I'll be hitting you up very soon with that. <laughs> yeah. So tell me, Rob, what are some other filmmakers you really, really are keen to and big fan of? Um, Stanley Kubrick, I love. The great um, Stanley Kubrick. It's hard, it's hard not to appreciate Kubrick. At least his films. Apparently, he was a total jerk in real life. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love Aronofsky. Darren Aronofsky. Um, there's a there's actually a New Zealand um, director. Um, shoot. Is it Taki? Is it um? Ta- Taiti from from know. Jojo Rabbit and The Last of yeah. Us. I know yes. he he has a very hard name to pronounce. And I don't want to um, botch it, but I will try anyways. <laughs> the incredible Takiti Taka Taika Watiti Taika Watiti. That sounds right. I'm glad you did you, it and not me. 
<laughs> Taika Wakiki. What? What? Taika Watiti, man, I would love to meet him, and I really apologize if he hears this. And I'm watching. <laughs> I'm just gonna pr- Google the pronunciation because it's gonna bother me because I, I I talk about I've talked about him a lot, and um, I like this the la- the um what we do in the shadows. I haven't seen that yet. I've been meaning to get to it. He's a he's a incredible talent. He directed um. He also directed the second Thor. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. I actually yeah. had no clue of that. Here we go. Here is the pronunciation according to Google. After the ad is over. <laughs> of course, there's an ad at, like the worst possible time. Oh man. You can't skip it either, can you? <laughs> nope. So. Taika Waititi. All right, I almost got it. Taika Waititi. Oh, you're Taika Waititi. I just well, seriously, I think thank you to Taika Watiti and his impact he's made on Hollywood so far. He's becoming like my favorite director, like slowly. Ooh. I mean I I compare him to Wes Anderson in a lot of ways. Oh yeah, you like Wes Anderson as well? Yeah. I haven't seen all his films. I, I I'm dropping the ball with Wes Anderson, but every one of his films I've seen I've loved. Oh hell yeah. What are some of those movies you've liked that have the from the Wes Anderson collection? Uh Moonlight Kingdom Great. or Moonrise Kingdom? Yeah, Moonrise Kingdom. Um The Grand Budapest Motel. Oh, one um, of the best movies of the tour. Isle of Dogs, year. which is his newer one. That was really yep, one of his animated with the Grey Brian Canston. Ugh, why I'm blanking on the name of it. George Clooney is in it. It's animated. Fantastic Mr. Fox. Fantastic Mr. Fox. Very underrated animated movie. And I think that about sums it up for his oh, hell yeah. my films fav- that I've seen. One of my top ten movies of all time is Rushmore, his second film effort, Ooh. which is great. Also, um, Bottle Rocket. If you could, his very first feature from '96, I would highly suggest. It's sweet. Those two movies are the or mo- the kind of the least Wes Anderson look. I mean, people okay. say Wes Anderson is his own genre, but that was he was still figuring out his voice, and then it all changed with the royal uh, with the Royal Tannenbaums. And I think I might have just watched Bottle Rocket. Oh man, it was Owen Wilson and Luke Wilson. Yes, and they're so they're like dope. Ro- they're robbers. Like, uh, robbers. Yeah. Oh, that was so Cold cross I- country. I really enjoyed it. Oh, yeah. But, yeah, I think, so like, tone. Wes Anderson's kind of quirky humor that, yeah. that also has depth. Like, I mean, that's pretty much. That's all we need. Ta- Taika, Ta- Taika, Ta- Taika Watiti. Yes, Did Taika Watiti. <laughs> Taika Watiti. I feel like he, he had, like, manages that same effect. Like, um, Eagle versus Shark. If you've seen that. I haven't seen that one yet. But it sounds my absolute so favorite of his, the hunt for the wilder people. Ooh, it's just no, I gotta quirky, check it out. but it also like if you let it, it'll make you cry. And it's it's its own brand. Like you identify like this is I'm watching a Taika Waititi film. That's the best part, and that's what's great about our tours and stuff like that. And uh, having that association, I mean, it's no wonder why he won best original screenplay. He wrote something so. So niche and out of the way, but yet it's just a beautiful story of uh, Jojo. Yeah, and Jojo Rabbit. I mean, someone said it best. This is watch this movie like you've never seen Hitler before. Hilarious. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> oh man. I mean, that <laughs> film when it got it was nominated for Best Picture. Am I misremembering that? I believe so. Yes, you're right on that. The fact that, like, honestly, I think that's one of the most controversial films I've ever seen. Yeah. And I've seen Clockwork Orange. Like, mm-hmm. But just the, like, I mean, you're thrown into this world and the first thing you see in the film is this little boy, like, how Hitlering. <laughs> that's, <laughs> and just, that's taboo and shit, but I think... And I, was... I've gone back and forth on um his mother. What's that actress? Scarlett, Scarlett Johansson. Johansson. I've gone back and forth on her. It's like, is she a good actor? Is she just hot? I <laughs> I think she's amazing. I mean, she won a Tony. She won a Tony. She nailed it in that. Oh, yeah. Double Oscar nominee this year. She's won a Tony. Um, you know, she's great at the MCU. I think Scarlett Johansson is actually kind of underrated for her acting chops. Again, she's yeah. a Tony where she's I mean, um, on stage. Was it? 
Ky- the Kylo Ren actor. <laughs> Adam Driver. I love Adam Driver. What was that guy. film with with her and Adam Driver? Marriage Story. Mar- that that film was crazy. Oh, crazy movie on divorce, and uh, I think both of those were great. And I'm a huge Noah Baumbach guy, so uh, he's awesome. Makes a lot of New yeah. York based movies and stuff. You know what's funny about that? So it's essentially based on his first marriage with an actual actress, Noah Baumbach. And throughout the movie, his character is based is pretty much based on him. They call him a genius often in the movie. I say, you're a genius. He's a genius. I just find that funny. I didn't know that. <laughs> just the quirky things I know. A little Easter egg. Yeah. So what are some of those controversial films? You mentioned the most con- – tell me some of the most controversial – out there crazy movies you've ever seen clockwork orange we've seen i actually saw that recently for the first time a few months ago and damn not a rewatchable but yet but not a rewatchable in the sense of oh i could really you know let's watch a clockwork orange on a beautiful (laughs) saturday afternoon with your wife you don't necessarily pick that but i it's an insane movie on control and stuff. you have to go into that film with the intention of really dissecting like humanity's worst problems i mean yeah very much there, so. there are two, not one, but two detailed depictions of rape. Yeah. Not 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 fun to watch at all. And like, yeah, it's just the main character is just basically going on a evil sin rampage. And at yeah. the end of the film, you feel bad for him. Like you actually like feel sorrow for him. And I don't I don't know this day, I mean that Maybe not everyone feels that way, um, but more than a couple of people have told me that they also are just like when they're brainwashing him into like hating his favorite musician, which yep. was Bach. I felt genuine sorrow for this man, and so I you watched com- him. You find him as a legitimate antihero, Alex Gibney? No, because at the end of the film, he's just he's still his evil self, you know. Mm willing to murder, willing to steal, willing to rape. You know, he doesn't change. An anti-hero requires legitimate change. I mean, the most, I think for our generation, probably one of the most obvious examples I can give is like Zuko from Avatar. Right. At the end of the show, he is a completely different character who has transitioned. Yeah, by the way, I got the name. It's not Alex Gibney. It's Alex. He's just Alex in the movie. Okay. But I just want to make that clear. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, again, not a rewatchable. I think <laughs> if you're into movies, you do have to watch it because it does, you know, it's a movie on psychiatry and a lot of social political subjects. And a, uh, as you said, it's the worst in humanity and exactly what we do not want to repeat. <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, staying on the Kubrick side and more of his, you know, not depressing movies to watch. Um, you know what I know something hot take I really do not like 2001 A Space Odyssey that's probably my one movie I don't like that everyone likes I think it's boring I think it drags I mean of course there's some amazing special effects for the time and now but it's just not for me how, how do you, it how do you goes it it goes on forever um, yeah I think it sets the stage and gives us sci-fi as we know it today yeah, no, no, very much so. It's very influential, and I understand its impact. And it's like I like its commentary on man, but I just the movie's just boring to me. It's almost like what I would say the Beatles are to music, and this is a controversial opinion I hold. So a lot of people, what is that? It's that the Beatles are just basic, but <laughs> I respect them because they they set music going in a direction. Music would not be what it is today if not for the Beatles. Sci-fi would Very much barely so. exist. I mean, I suppose you could always make the argument that something else would have come along and, and set that bar. But we um, never know, though, so we have to appreciate 2001 for making it possible. But 2001, Space Odyssey made... It made sci-fi what it is today. Absolutely. So that's I why think- I respect it. I just, <laughs> And we see those monoliths making a comeback, huh? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> All over the... So... Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's something else. Now my, my now a Kubrick movie I absolutely love. There's two I absolutely love. I love The Shining. Mm. One of my 
true favorite horror movie. Like I, I would say when someone asks me what's your favorite horror movie, I usually say Get Out. But I understand that's probably more of a thriller. But if you're talking about Get genuine, Out, you can genuinely make comparisons between oh, Get yeah. Out and um, The Shining. It's actually really interesting. Really, I um, I I told I can see where you're saying. I never put that thought in my head, but that does make sense when you're saying it. What do you think of the shining? All the that talk about Easter eggs and the do you believe in the conspiracies and the subliminal messages and stuff? Now that movie is so hyped to be scary as hell. It's not necessarily <laughs> scary per se, but it's just so suspenseful and tense, which is the point of the horror movie, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely you know Jack Nicholson at his. Top. Oh, I love that guy. I love Jack Nicholson a lot. At his absolute best. Um, I think I typically like horror films that are along those lines. They're not your, what people think of when they think horror film. They either think slasher or jump scare, supernatural right. type stuff. And that's, this is just a film about a, care, uh, a family going insane together. Yep. And to me, that's more genuinely terrifying then i don't know some demonic creature Someone attacking just... the depths of another universe <laughs> yeah we don't need it we want the scary part of the human beings which is you know sadly could be true and um i think the shining we always bob that and jack nicholson with a hell of a performance and wow 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 and uh any more thoughts on the shining before we talk about my other kubrick one i absolutely love Here's Johnny. <laughs> we got a sound bite out of that one. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Now my other Kubrick movie I absolutely love, Full Metal Jacket. That's that's one of my movies. Man, talk about all the underlying themes there. When I saw it the very first time, I saw it like in high school, like really late at night. And I watched it. I thought it was a comedy. You know, we see Gomer, <laughs> we see Gomer Pot, we see Sergeant Gunnery, um, we see uh, Gunnery, Sergeant Gunnery Hartman, we see Gomer Pyle, the joke <laughs> and Joker. And I thought it was a, I thought he was, it was a comedy. He was just making fun of how, how awful he is. And then when I, the most absurd, one of the most absurd 180 turns ever in film. Spoiler alert. When. He shoots his sergeant and then kills himself. I'm going to go slow. Wow. I felt, I remember taking a couple minutes and just think like, Jesus. Because it, it's remember, not a comedy. I mean, what is it? It's the first scene of the movie. They're just buzzing their heads, right? That's the yep. first scene. Right. From like, I mean, from the buzz cuts to the suicide, the murder suicide, I could not stop laughing. Yeah, exactly. It was hilarious. <laughs> He's like, I mean, the, all just all this stuff he says and assaulted, and eat this donut and stuff like and I, that. <laughs> I mean, and the, I feel like this is pretty common knowledge, but for those of you who may not know, uh, the drill sergeant in the film is a real drill sergeant. Yeah, and that it's all improv. Exactly. Like, <laughs> damn. I just love his old, his extreme close up, the screaming, at going pile, and then it just. Oh my god! Like that was the cre- one of the creepiest deaths I ever saw, and it's pretty graphic. And he has the typical Kubrick stare. If you you know the typical Kubrick scare, the Kubrick stare, which symbolizes that uh, the character is about to go insane. And uh, yeah. about that, it's, it is two movies in one. And apparently, like not not to dip in the movie, that actually apparently was a tr- real thing that happened. That's based on a real event of a in the Vietnam. The one of the sergeants couldn't take it anymore, and he killed, um, and he wound up killing his sergeant, which they they were trained back then to be killers, and well, it happened, and uh, yeah, well, I mean, shit, and then but the second it's really moving two halves, and I really like the other me- Vietnam stuff, so some intense action scenes. So I mean, like, I I'd, um, I'd say it's one of the portrayal. and maybe you agree or disagree, but I think it's one of the earliest films that went that was you know popular to really explore mental health yeah no i very much think that and and ptsd and like that's that's exactly what happened and uh i i completely agree with your take on that and i mean there's you know the typical drug use that you see in like vietnam war films i actually recently saw this um 
I think I was having trouble sleeping one night. It was like one in the morning and mm-hmm. I just was like Googling random stuff. And it was just this, this interview with, uh, I can't even remember the guy's name, but he was a Vietnam vet. Mm-hmm. And he said that the first night he was there in Vietnam, um, in Vietnam, he was on guard and one of the guys on guard with him lit a cigarette. It was dark at this point. So he lights a cigarette, smoking a cigarette. And the light from his cigarette gave his position away to a sniper. Oh, no. This is his first night in Vietnam. This guy gets his head blown off oh. by a sniper. And so he finishes his patrol. And he goes into his bunks. And he, he talks to one of the guys that was there for a while already. And he says, how, how do you guys cope with this? And the guy gives him you know, a, a joint laced with mm. like opium. And so that's what he, he said every night from that night till the day he left, like months later, he was high on opium every single night. And that was how he got through it. Well, I mean, obviously I cannot say I've been in that person's shoes and we <laughs> hopefully true, I never will. Yes. We do appreciate all the men and women who are in our armed forces for that and the sacrifice we made and especially when it comes to Vietnam War, we could debate all day whether that was justified to be there or not. But shit, like, wow, those, those men really had to go through that. I mean, seeing someone get sniped like that, and it just is so sad how vet, Vietnam vets in particular were treated once they came home. And I, th- I don't know if you ever seen Ken Bird's doc on Vietnam. But it, I haven't. It's really inspiring. It's probably my favorite documentary ever. And, uh, I mean, it just shows – the mistakes we made on both sides it really wasn't um it really was a loss i know the united states considers it a loss but it really was a loss for them for the vietnamese as well both the vc and and uh, south vietnam side and it's just so it's insane what happened that time and what we went through just to fight ideologies really so that was ken Berg. Yeah. ken burns ken burns i'll have to check that out yeah, you'll really like it a lot. I think I'd love to hear your opinion on it. And uh, we, it, 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 it's honest portrayal of they. They both talk to both sides. No historians. Just people who are directly involved in the armed forces for both the United States, Viet Cong, and um, South Vietnamese. So some time, man. And but hey, there's some quite some stories that came out of it. And Full Metal Jacket is something else. I think it was a real honest portrayal. Yeah. Have um Have you seen Doctor Strangelove? I have seen Dr. Strangelove. I do think I like it. You know, I think, um, talk about, you know, I think that may be his War. most underrated film. Really underrated film. Why do you say that? I, I hadn't heard of it. And oh, so, so basically like how I got into film was pretty much like toward the end of my junior year of college into my senior year. How about that? And I just started working through directors essentially. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of, I pretty much started with Aronofsky. That's a great decision. And so That's I went great, from um, Aronofsky um, to Kubrick. And I got to Dr. Strangelove and I was like, I have never heard of this film. Yeah, like, like... What is this? And I was just, it was hysterical. I mean, it's just a commentary making fun of, like, it's just pure Kubrick shitting on the whole Cold War... Mm -hmm. fear of the atom bomb like all these people are freaking out about the cold war and the nuke and for (laughs) what (laughs) it's like exactly and for what how about peter sellers three he did three roles in that film killed them all (laughs) that was crazy oh man i liked i did like dr strange love hilarious movie hilarious and like you said a big hullabaloo even though at the end they wound up getting blown up anyways you know the the original alternate ending they were supposed to have a big food fight I, I did not know that. There are stills. I don't know if it's available to actually watch the deleted scene, but you could look it up. There's pictures on Google Images and everything. Shoot. I have to check that out. <laughs> uh, Darren Aronofsky. I, I love Black Swan and The Wrestler, man. Oh, The Wrestler? That film breaks my heart. <laughs> it's, it's some movie based on, um, you know, not giving up on your dreams still, even after the fact. And, um, being in different places and obsession. Those two really Randy, go hand in, in there. What was the main character in The Wrestlers? Randy the Ram Randy. Robinson. 
Was do you know if he was like loosely based off of Hulk Hogan? He was loosely based off of Jake the Snake Roberts, if you know who that is. Jake the Snake, I do not. I'm not. I'm not a mm-hmm. big wrestling guy. <laughs> but yeah, Jake the Snake Roberts, another guy strange from his daughter. I mean, kind of looks like shit, but hey, he still try to wrestle. And then the wrestling industry, hey, we could see if you're not the John Cena's, you're not the Stone Cold Steve Austin's, you're not the Rocks. It could be a really dark place to try, try to entertain people. You know, like. Yeah. wrestling in old meat factories instead of in high schools instead of madison square garden it, it's something else where people are trying to make a name for themselves in the wrestling industry you know yeah <laughs> the reason i brought up hulk hogan was because i actually i was pretty young i want to say like nine or ten but i saw him at a restaurant in stanford no way the hulk hogan yeah, talk about and, and, I think at that point, I literally, like, my dad explained to me who Hulk Hogan was because I, I didn't know. And I swear this guy's arms were, like, the size of my body. <laughs> my dad was like, hey, that's Hulk Hogan. We're not going to bother him, but he's a really famous wrestler. <laughs> oh, you didn't want to talk and say, hey, brother. Hey, Rob. <laughs> well, we, he just kind of figured, like, he probably gets that all the time. and He's trying to have a right. nice meal. No, I definitely hear you there. <laughs> Do you remember the name of the restaurant? Ah, oh, shoot. It was like right off of, would it be exit eight? Mm. If you're getting off of 95. Yeah, I mean, WWE headquarters are in um, Stanford, so it makes sense that he was there. Yeah, I can't remember where it was. It was mm-hmm. some place for lunch. I remember I was working with my dad that day. He was, he's a plumber and I was just, I was, he had some extra work that he needed to get done that set, like on a Saturday. And we went there for lunch after we finished. And How about man, that? I was like, oh, it's Hulk Hogan. What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> you ever meet any other famous? You ever actually meet any celebrities? Actually, one other time. And yeah, I was, uh, I was actually when I was coming home from Papua New Guinea. Um, I was in an airport in Australia. Like on airport a layover. In Australia. Okay. And I didn't recognize him at first. But Jason Momoa walks right past me. And like, we were going through the door at the same time. And so I was like, you look familiar. I literally said said that that to him. I was like, (laughs) you look familiar. And he was like, he just said, cool, bro. And he went and sat down. And then I was sitting at the table right next to him. And me and my friends were playing a card game. And his kids start watching us play the card game. Jason Momoa's kid. Jason Momoa's kids, they're watching us play the game and, and asking us about the game. And so so I see his kids, and I recognized his kids before I recognized him, which sounds really weird. But it's that Carhartt commercial. He's in this Carhartt commercial mm-hmm. wearing, like, the pants, and he's, like, he's uh, Jason Momoa does this, like, monologue where he's, like, I remember growing up, all I ever wanted to be was a father. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't do it without these Carhartt pants. He doesn't say that exactly, but it's just like <laughs> over dramatized Carhartt. Carhartt commercial. And I remember his kids were in it, and he talks about being a father. So I see his kids, and I'm like, "Oh my gosh!" I just told Jason Momoa that he looks familiar. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so t- I tried to like make up for it, and I was like, uh, "I'm a big climber. I love climbing. I do it like that." So like probably my biggest like hobby and pastime and one of my favorite climbers chris sharma jason momoa actually climbs with him um no way and so i was like i was like jason teach me how to climb like you and he just kind of chuckled and like went on his day but it was just like i was (laughs) i really like he probably was so annoyed like he's just in an airport which is already first world problems tends to be annoying enough right um but then this kid is just like, you look familiar. And he's like, okay, cool. yeah. You but know what, who I am. <laughs> but what was nice is uh, he's probably happy he didn't bombard him about a movie he was in. Or, or yeah. something. Like, you talked about actual rock climbing of genuine interest. but That was where that. I originally heard of him. When I first saw him in a film, when I first saw him in Game of Thrones, yeah. I was like, that guy climbs with Chris Sharma. So mm-hmm. I kind of like, he's not even, I mean, he... He's actually really good at climbing too. Like, yeah, he's pretty legit, hun. And he has some <laughs> Adonis body. So, yeah, I just remember being like, "Whoa, that guy climbs with Chris Sharma." Now he's called Drogo in Game of Thrones, and 
Jason. I was just like, cool. How about that? So I actually knew him as a climber before I knew he acted. No way. That's beautiful. So, yeah. So it's, there was Jason Momoa and Hulk Hogan. Any other great interactions? Those are some great ones though. I love Jason and Hulk. I wonder if, uh, you know, you get Hulk in his prime and you have Jason Momoa and Hulk Hogan fight. Who would win? (laughs) (laughs) Boy. That would be an interesting battle of the ages. I mean, Hulk Hogan doesn't lose, and he did take down Andre the Giant back in the day. So, <laughs> tell me about it, man. Tell me about it. So, um, now that that's inc- that that that's awesome, man. That's awesome. And uh, yeah, really, is, I don't I don't see celebrities a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> is there any other um, movie directors that we missed out that you really attuned to your scorsese fan spike lee captain bigelow any any other ones we missing besides you continuing to see the great movies of our of our world i mean tarantino tarantino of course quentin yep um you excited for dune you know i don't know (laughs) is he directing a, a doom film yeah, he's doing a whole reboot. Timothy Chalamet, Josh Brolin, gonna okay, see if they could do justice to the '80s cult. Because well, I, I remember seeing like a not a trailer, but like a poster almost. Yeah. Um, I didn't Something look like at who was directing it. I wonder if that would have caught my eye better. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, this is your boy Dennis Villain. I know he's a unique, another hard last name. Vino, Dennis Villain uh, Wave. I I always yeah. feel like I say it wrong. <laughs> but hey probably the one of the best directors from this past decade. So, um, oh man. And, and is there any shows you're really getting in? You've been getting into you mentioned game of Thrones. I know you actually read the actual game of Thrones novels. So yeah, I was reading those in high school during, so you, during you were the, that. you were the true, you were the original OG fan. I know the show came out 2013 was the first season, but you were a true I, game of Thrones guy. I watched the pilot and then I said, no, this, these are books. I am not <laughs> watching it first. And so I, I started reading the books. Actually, Tabitha Goulart gave them to me pretty much. No way. You guys started at all, huh? You guys <laughs> yeah. are the true ones. <laughs> um, How did you feel about the ending of Game of Thrones? Were you disappointed by the finale? Uh, if if the author ever finishes the books, I hope it goes differently. Mm. Um, I just felt like all the characters got flat. Not only did they get flat, but they started acting contrary to who they were. Um, yeah, I think that's from TV. That's all from the TV writers. Which I mean, character way. is like huge for me. I, I could watch the crappiest show in the world, and if it has a captivating main character, you know, the plot could suck. All the other actors could suck, but that main character, if if that's a, you know, compelling character, I'll stick with it. We appreciate people who like you sticking with that. And is <laughs> is um who did you want to see win the Game of Thrones? The throne. I like Tyrion Lannister. I yeah, like either that. either Tyrion Lannister or Jon Snow. I I'm a I'm a, got a soft spot for Jon Snow. I don't. Mm-hmm. And he's he's way better in the books too. So that was part really? of it. <laughs> How about that? So, Rob, we've been at it for almost an hour and a half, killing it. I've sure. been enjoying this time. Um, there's just one more thing I want to do before we say goodbye, and that is the Proust Questionnaire, which is a just series of very deep questions. Rapid fire, but deep questions. Okay. And uh, I'm really intrigued with your answers on these, Rob. So, uh, first things first, Rob, what is your favorite word? Oh, my favorite word. That is something I don't think about very often. Mm-hmm. I feel like if you go by amount of times that I say it, I would. It's probably the word true. True. Like I probably like I say it to agree. I say it to affirm. I just use the word true a lot. Um, Beautiful. I've always liked the way the word indubitably sounds. Indubitably. 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 Which just means indeed. <laughs> well, do you want to go out tonight? Indubitably. I am so using that. <laughs> no. What is your least favorite word, Rob? Uh, um, gonna. 
Gonna. <laughs> and I, I say it all the time. I, I say or it all the time. G-O-N-N-A. I text it. Uh, I just, and it's just, it's just so lazy. And what you bleh. gonna do about it? <laughs> but I, I do it all the time. What you gonna do about it, Rob? Oh, that was too easy. I've even fallen mm. into the habit of saying, I'm a, I'm a go to the store. I'm a B, I'm a B, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a B. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what turns you on in this world, Rob? Mm. Pretty much seeing people in just stepping up, you know, being the action force in their lives. How about that? I like that. I love, I love seeing people be the best person Ambition. they can be. It's a, you know, the, just the, the inert thing. You know, I have something to prove. I like Seeing that. people with that drive. I love ambition a lot. That's probably my favorite word and all those things. So we really agree on that. Um, yeah. What turns you off in this world? Kind of uh, the opposite end of that is just passivity. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely tend to to catch myself living in more fear and anxiety than I'd like and, and just staying still. I like so. We appreciate that. Uh, number five, what sound or noise do you love? Sound or noise? Hmm. That's a really good question. Maybe maybe a baby's giggling. <laughs> baby's giggling. All right. All right. Number six, what sound or noise do you hate? Um... Excuse me, choking over my own breath or something. Um, hmm. Okay, right now I have really annoying loud neighbors. <laughs> Ooh. So I don't know. Like that kid we know. were talking about, you have to stand your ground. I don't know if uh, they're just really clueless or just really inconsiderate, but they're always playing with their like puppy like all hours of the night. Mamma mia. Well, we do not so like we have our a, neighbors. We have a stick around that we, we bang on, on the floor or on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do not like your neighbors on that one, man. Normally, uh, I like dogs playing, the sound of dogs playing, but not this time. <laughs> damn you, Rob's neighbors. <laughs> All right. What is your favorite curse word? Shit. <laughs> Shit. Number eight. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? That's a, I've never thought of that. Hmm. I guess, uh, you know, what I went to school for was, you know, to do kind of church ministry stuff. So that, uh, I ended up procuring a foolish amount of debt, not, you know, below like the average amount that they say is the average, but still too much for that career to, to reasonably pay for. So, but hey, yeah, man, the, it's, it's never too late. Yeah. Maybe one day. Heck, I, I think at this point, my kind of philosophy on it has kind of changed too, where I'd rather just work full time as an electrician and be able to just, volunteer at churches and rather than you know they could use their money for you know people in need or whatever else and not have to pay me (laughs) right right i hear you on that brother uh tell me number nine what profession what profession would you not like to do Mm. janitor or like garbage man Mm -hmm. (laughs) this just seemed very un like I'm sure there are people out there that really enjoy doing that, but it's not for me. All right. But mad, mad, mad respect. Mad respect to the garbage men out there. For sure. We appreciate anybody who helps make this world, make our world better. And number 10, if heaven exists, Rob, what would you like to hear God say to you when you arrive at the pearly gates? Ooh. Welcome home, I guess. 
Beautiful. Without the I guess, just just welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> well, He's like, oh, I, I guess you're here. Sure, come in. <laughs> <laughs> nice and open arms, man. Well, Rob, it's been nothing but a pleasure. I've really enjoyed catching up with you. I really like the things we've talked about, especially all our movie stuff, our um, what we've been up to, the differences between the Midwest and the tri-state area. It's been an absolute pleasure, Rob. And uh, before we say goodbye, is there anything else you want to say before we uh, bid you a for do? Oh, thanks for having me on. <laughs> uh, I'm really enjoying the podcast. Keep it up. Keep on pursuing those those dreams. And heck yeah, dude. Well, that means a lot to me, to me, Rob. Thank you so much. I hope one day in the near future in a COVID-free world, I can see you again in person. I would love to get to know your wife and uh, see and uh, all of us hang out. And uh, like, you know what I mean by that? Like, I don't mean get to know your wife. You know what I mean, right? <laughs> I would never have interpreted it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Just making sure you know how crazy people <laughs> interpret things, you know? Yeah. But seriously, though, I would I would love to for all of us to hang out. Love to catch up with besides the mics, and um, let's keep staying in touch. I'm sure I'll see you before you know it, and I would love you yeah. to come back on one day if you'd like. Okay, we should uh, <laughs> we should try to do like a, a Norwalk High School reunion, like. I am not a, or a Zoom call. <laughs> I am not opposed to that. We will see in the near future with that. Heck yeah. Starting to work on it. But seriously, Rob, you have a lot of my respect. As I said, you're I'm a big fan of you. And seriously, man, you are one incredible human being. And I hope oh, I can you. see you really, really soon. Thank you so much for coming on. And um, you're the man, Rob. You are simply the man. With that, that's the incredible Rob Duncan. And again, I will see you really, really soon, my friend. I hope you have a great night. And again, stay awesome. All right, you too. All right, have a good night. Yeah, you too.